stand in the pulpit? Or in other words, do you think that all the work is given just to the pastor? Given to each and every one of us. We all have a part to play. Let them understand that there is a large work to be done outside the pulpit by thousands of consecrated lay members. It says here, while the souls of men are dying and the master calls for you, let none hear you idly saying, there is nothing I can do. There's always something we can do. You know, I used to think that in order to serve the Lord, I had to be a great evangelist like, like Graham, Billy Graham. There is it. Yeah, sister? Oh, uh. And the Lord had to sit me down and said, I gave you a spear. This is your bubble, your surroundings, your neighbors, your co-workers. These are the ones you are to evangelize. You don't have to do something, you know, everybody's not called to do a great, enormous work. But the work that he does give us is influential and it is very important. You know, we're to be a light in the world. Does that light shine? We don't want to hide it. But we also don't want to burn people with it either. <laughs> right? We, we can do that. We could, I mean, like, we, some, sometimes, you know, we could be so zealous where we just shove the truth down people's throat and they vomit it back up. But a lot of people didn't like Jesus. Yeah. The leaders hated him. They wanted to kill him. He Did was abusive to them. Mm -hmm. But who was the ones who loved Jesus? The harlots. The poor. The liars. The thieves. All the heathens. The money changers. The tax collectors. Right? Outcasts. Mm -hmm. But why do they love him? They were at the bottom already. And they had no other help. We need to get to the bottom. The, the church leaders needed to get to the bottom and not keep looking at themselves. But why did they love him? He was compassionate. So they witnessed. Mm -hmm. So he had a true witness. His witness said, I love you. And they saw it. They he were glad. gave them hope. Huh? He gave them hope. He gave them hope. That's right. Hope dealers, not dope dealers. Yes. I used to have a shirt that said that. Because I used to do that. But we have we all have a spear, wherever it is. We need to be faithful in that spirit. If you don't know how to evangelize, how to witness, ask the Lord. Say, Lord, what is it? You know, I used to think that every day you had to do something magnificent. All you have to do is plant some seeds. Day by day, plant seeds. Seeds of love, I seeds have, of truth. I have very little to offer. I am at the bottom, but still God requires a lot from me. Mm -hmm. It seems like I can do nothing, but he, he gives me what I need. Amen. Who would like to read question number two? What, what has Christ provided to enable each Christian to do his appointed work? We can find the answer in Romans 12, verses 4 through 8. You want to you wanna go ahead and, and read verse 3? Sure, two, three, 3 through 8. Yeah. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are of one body in Christ and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing, I'm going to eight, 
differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Amen. So the question was, what has Christ provided to enable each Christian to do his appointed work? What's the answer? He gives us the gifts to be able to do certain things. That's right. He gives us all gifts. Yes. And, and if we you all don't... Have, we all have different gifts from one another. We're not all the same. That's right. And if we don't know what your gift is, ask. Amen. Lord, what is my gift? You know, some people go their whole lives without realizing what their gift is. You don't have to know your gift. Just work for God. Yeah. I mean, but it comes out. Yeah. Ask and you shall receive, he said. So if you ask, Lord, what is my gift? Some people have the gift of speaking. Billy Graham was one of those people. Right? He lowered hundreds of thousands to his seminar because he was a great articulate speaker. Some people are good at medical ministry, healing, like Barbara O'Neill, like my mother, like other people, a lot of other people. Some people are good at selling books. Some people are good at knocking on doors. Everybody doesn't have the same talent. But the talent that we do have, we are obligated to use it for the service of God. Some of us are good at getting close to people and ministering to their needs, you know. Um, you want to read that quote? I sure do. God's <laughs> servants do not all possess the same gifts, but they are all his workmen. Each is to learn of the great teacher and this then to communicate what he has learned. God has given to each of his messengers as individual work. There is diversity of gifts, but all the workers are to blend in harmony, controlled by the sanctifying influence of the Holy Spirit. As they make known the gospel of salvation, many will be convicted and converted by the power of God. The human instrumentality is hid with Christ in God. And Christ appears as the chiefest among ten thousands, the one altogether lovely. Acts of the Apostles, page 274. Amen. So God gives us gifts, but are we to harbor these gifts to ourselves? No. I know me, I'm, this is something I'm still learning. I was always a taker. I like taking stuff. But God had to show me how in his kingdom, we are to take, not for ourselves, but we are to take to give. So as we take away in our, when we sit at the feet of Christ and we learn day by day, we should be sharing these things with others. Not so much, you don't have to share, you know, all type of scriptures or anything. You just share in your life that love that God is sharing with you, share it in your life. You know, that's what wins souls. Not arguments, not all these things. Sometimes you have to chisel away the hardness of someone's outer exterior before they'd be willing to hear, you know, what you truly have to say. But we all have this. Yes, sir. It reminds me of the story of the demoniac. He didn't have all that education he didn't have all the the time spent with god like the disciples and others did but god just sent him out to go share his testimony and that was that was all he was required to do and sometimes it's as simple as just sharing our testimony what god has done with us right. and that's working for the lord but look what paul says in romans 12 verse 3 he says through the grace that was what given given it was given to me, and now I share this grace with you. You know, as I read, because I, I, I became fascinated with the book of Acts. 
And I read it probably five times, back to back to back. I said, how is it that Paul won so many people to Christ? And if you look at him and his life, and one thing that I really stood out is the fact that he always gave his testimony. And he always went back to the event where he was knocked off his horse. He's like, I was this, God did this, and here I am. And it was a witness. And he truly believed it. And because of that, he was a, he was a bright light in dark places. I mean, this man went on missionary trips everywhere. Back, it's easier now. You can fly and do all this. But this man was on ships, shipwreck, all this stuff, <laughs> burned, bit, bit with snakes and tortured and whipped. And yet his light was still shining because what God gave him, he had to share. We can't hide it. We cannot go up into the mountains and hide away just because we have a message to flee the cities. Here is where the people are. God loves you. Amen. Who would like to read question three? Question three is, what was the world's estimate of Peter and John as they witnessed for the master? And that verse is taken from Acts, verse 4. I meant, sorry, chapter 4 and verse 13. It says the first part, but I don't know how to just read the first part, so I'll read the whole thing. Yeah, go ahead. It says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Yeah. And so the world's first estimate of Peter and John was that they were bold, but they were also unlearned and ignorant. And so they didn't let the fact that they were ignorant and unlearned stop them. They still went forth boldly. And so we have no excuse. No. So the note says, there are many who will spend and be spent to win souls to Christ. In obedience to the Great Commission, they will go forth to work for the Master. Under the ministration of angels, ordinary men will be moved by the Spirit of God to warn people in the highways and byways. Humble men who do not trust in their gifts, but who work in simplicity, trusting always in God, will share in the joy of the Savior as their persevering prayers bring souls to the cross. Amen. What kind of men did she say? She said humble men. Humble. Mm -hmm. That's okay. like first qualification right there. Humble. humble with persevering prayer. With prayer. Never think, never come to the point where you're witnessing we can get caught up in witnessing to the point where, wow, I'm doing this. Yeah. And you'll lose your blessing. You'll lose the spirit. I've been there. Knocking on doors, canvassing, doing all types of stuff. I did that the first four years of, of, of being a Christian. But we take God's glory. But we have to remember that everything that we have, God gave us. It's not ours. It's not ours. And to think so is selfishness and pride and arrogance. But if we keep it before us and we sit at the feet of Christ, Lord, thank you. Remember, the Bible says in everything, give thanks. Every soul that you are, God gives you the ability because it's God. He's the orchestrator. He orchestrates everything. It's the Holy Spirit. Everyone who you witness to, God orchestrated it. You give thanks to him. You praise him. Paul said, he said, uh... As in second, uh, First Thessalonians 5, verse 16 to 18 says, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. If we do these things, we'll be some strong witnesses. Rejoice evermore. It says, in how many things give thanks? Oh, everything. Oh. 
You know, that's why the things that Paul went through, the tragedies, shipwreck, bit by snake, all these things, why was it such a strong witness as well? Because in those moments, he didn't fret, he didn't complain, he gave thanks. He praised the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for that snake bite. I can only imagine. They're looking at him like he's crazy, man. He's shipwrecked. He's not worried. And because of his faithfulness, because of his faith, because of his trust in the Lord, that was a witness. When the storm is coming around you and you put your faith in the Lord, that's a light. Man, how did he do that? Imagine a, 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 a brother or sister, you know, they go through a great tragedy in their life. And they just have so much peace. That's a witness. You know, if we're over here flailing and complaining and tripping out, and that's not a witness. That's saying that, hey, you know, I don't trust the Lord. Yeah. But God was looking for humble men and women. Not to trust in their own gifts, but to trust in the one who gave them those gifts. Number four. Who would like to read that? Come on. Number four. Okay, what sort of person does God most commonly call to his service? It's first Corinthians one, twenty six and twenty seven. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Go ahead, keep reading. Verse 28. Okay. And the base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. Verse 29. That no flesh should glory in his presence. Yeah. So what sort of person does God commonly call to service? The unlikely. The unlikely. The underdog. When I was young, I used to watch something called Rocky movie the boxer and i never knew why i liked it so much when he sucked so bad but i always rooted for him and i i in my life i was an underdog you know i still am an underdog but god calls underdogs god calls the feeble he calls the weak he doesn't want mighty men he doesn't want men that trust in themselves men who are prideful he wants the ones who realize and know i can't do this you know, in, the, in, in, in Sinai, when Israel made the covenant with the Lord and said, all that the Lord will do, or all that the Lord says we will do, that was the number one mistake right there. Instead of admitting, Lord, we cannot do this. But God calls, he says, the despised, the base things, the foolish things, a weak thing. What kind of God is it? That's so outside of the norm of world, of the world. But that's the God we serve. He doesn't work like the world. He doesn't see as the world. God said, I can make the rocks cry out. That would trip me out if I see, <laughs> see some rocks crying out. But God calls you don't have to have a, the ability. All you have to have is the desire. The Bible says, I don't know the verse, but if you know it, quote it for me. If there first be a willing mind, it is acceptable to that which a man has and not to that which a man does not have. Willing mind. Are you willing? Yes. That's 2 Corinthians 8.12. 2 Corinthians 8.12. Thank you, brother. So, it's all about our willingness. Are we willing? Could Moses part the Red Sea? But was he willing to go where God led him? That's what parted the Red Sea. Not him. Good, good uh, choice. <laughs> <laughs> good choice? Praise the Lord. You know, 
um, go ahead, read that quote. Come on. And if you guys ever have, just speak out. Jesus chose unlearned fishermen because they had not been schooled in the traditions and erroneous customs of their time. They were men of native ability, and they were humble and teachable, men whom he could educate for his work. In the common walks of life, there is many a man patiently treading the round of daily toil, unconscious that he possesses powers which, if called into action, would raise him to, to an equality with the world's most honored men. The touch of a skillful hand is needed to arouse the, those dormant faculties. Mm. It was such men that Jesus called to be his co-laborers, and he gave them the advantage of association with himself. Never had the world's great men such a teacher. When the disciples came forth from the, from the Savior's training, they were no longer ignorant and uncultured. They had become like him in mind and character. And men took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Yeah. Any comments? Come on, eh? It says, like where it said, the touch of a skillful hand is needed to arouse those dormant doctors. God can take a hot mess and make a beautiful piece of work. Because you look at Peter, you look at James and John, the sons of thunder, they like to rumble. They they called, they were ready for the Lord to call down fire from heaven and, and do genocide on the whole people. Do you realize that? Genocide. No different from Hitler. That was in them. But because they constantly walked with the Lord, they constantly listened to his teaching, they constantly beheld him. Eventually, they became changed. God could have called Herod. God could have called the rulers of Rome. God could have called the great men of the earth. But he went and called fishermen. Stinky fishermen. Tired fishermen. Messed up backs. Messed up hands. He calls us. Wherever we are in life. You don't need a great education. All you need is a willing spirit. God is able. Number five, Katharina. Oh, Brother Shane, would you like to read that? Go ahead. I'll get you next. What different kinds of people will pour out his spirit? Acts 2, 17 and 18. Will God. And yeah, what different kinds of people will God pour out His Spirit? Yeah. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of My Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. Amen. But what different kinds of people will God pour out his spirit on? Every and anybody. Well, it looks like to me. Old, young, man, woman, child. Black, white, brown, orange, pink. Doesn't matter. Do you want God's spirit? Sometimes we have to be like the man in the parable where Christ spoke about the man who had some guest over late at night. And he didn't have anything to give them. So he went to his neighbors and he pleaded with him. And he kept knocking on the door. The man didn't answer. The man go away, man. It's late. But he kept pleading and pleading and pleading until eventually the perseverance, right? 
perseverance. We must plead with God for His Spirit. Because He doesn't always just... Sometimes He wants to see how bad do you want. Are you willing to fast for a few days? You would think God could do it better. But He uses us. Yes. Humble, yucky us. <laughs> it takes man to relate to man. That's why God became a man. Because that was the only way, that was the only way man would have received the witness of God, was seeing God in man. You know, it's like a dog. Can you relate to a dog? Can you? Can you relate to a roach? Or a monkey? What would be the only way to relate to them? By becoming them. Then you communicate. Same thing with God. God did that for us, but God wants to give us all his spirit. And it doesn't matter who you are, where you are, just a willingness. Would you like to read the note, brother? Time is short, and there is much to be done. Let all who can, old and young, men, women, and children, take up this work. As they go forth, the Lord will open the way before them. The words that they speak will be as seeds sown in good ground. Many souls will be saved as a result of the willing service. Christ declared, If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. He is doing this work that he calls upon old, young, old and young men, women, and youth to cooperate with him. While Christ draws, those who have tasted of the word of life must draw with Christ. Human instrumentalities must cooperate with the divine intelligences. It says in the first paragraph, last sentence, many souls will be saved as a result of what? A willing service. Willing. God does it for us. God, are we willing? Are we willing to step out of our comfort zone? That's a big one. Many of us become ineffective in our witnessing because of self. Oh, I can't do this. Oh, I'm not good enough. No, you're not. But the Lord is mighty. He it is it not you. us. It is God in us. That's right. You know, I used to, I remember when I would be out street preaching, and the Lord, like, I see someone, and the Lord said, go pray with that person. And I would try to reason with myself. Oh, God, they're not trying to hear it. They, because I'm looking at the outward appearance. They look like an emo. They got tattoos and piercings. And I'm being judgmental at the moment. The Lord said, go do it. And when I did it, amazing things happened. You know, they were there. I was there to minister to them. They were willing to hear and listen to the gospel receive Christ as your Savior. Yes? Sometimes it takes us putting our feet in the water before we actually, the waters part. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's interesting. This past week, I believe, yeah, it was this past week that I was listening to something and sometimes we reason ourselves, just like you said, sometimes we reason ourselves out of doing things that we know, like, when God calls us to do it, and then, and then we're like, well... And then we take longer and longer, and the longer we wait, the harder it is. Mm -hmm. And they gave this illustration. I don't know if you guys know, like, a cold plunge. Like, um, there's, there's some people that... It actually has a lot of health benefits. So they, like, go into, like... Uh, they do a cold plunge. So, in other words, they go into ice water, like, water that's, like, really, really, yeah. really cold. Yeah, they jump in. But, like, when, you, when you, you just look at it and when you just reason, you're like, I ain't going in there. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. It's just, <laughs> so, so the longer we wait, the harder it's going to be. Sometimes you got to do it before your brain fully recognizes every single thing and before your brain can talk yourself out of it. Yeah. Just, like, jump in. There's a, 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 a slogan I used to use a lot. I made it up. 
hesitation leads to devastation. It's very true. And I, I use that in the context when I was in, in the streets. When you hesitate to act, it, it, can, it can lose your life. You know? It's even like um, my sister got in a car wreck and because of hesitation. Yeah. You hesitate when the Holy Spirit whispers in your ear, tells you, go to that person. Don't hesitate. Say, no, I don't know what I'm about to even say, but I'm going. That's how it works. I used to think you have to know, have everything mapped out, right? Have a big, everything mapped. The Lord says, just go. They didn't know in, in, in the wilderness, right? Children of Israel, they didn't know where they were going. They were just going day by day. So the Lord led them where it seemed impossible. Why would you lead us here? But the Lord led them there to the Red Sea. Because the Lord knew. Moses knew too. He didn't know how. He didn't know what. God could have came down. His hand could have came down from heaven, scooped them all up and taken them on the other side or whatever. But they just went. So sometimes things won't seem very reasonable yeah. to us. Yeah. Like you don't have to see the whole flight of stairs to take the first step. Oh. And yeah, it's about making decisions and making decisions quickly. It's like, it's like imagine a staircase or a ladder and then half the ladder is cut off with clouds. You can't see past the clouds. But you got to have the faith to go through it, you know, to get to the other side, to the heavenly realm, whatever. You know, hesitation, never hesitate. And, and a, in every aspect, when the Lord is telling you to surrender something, don't hesitate. Because the longer you hesitate, the harder it becomes. And the less inclined you will be to do it. Trust me, I know. But when the Lord speaks, move. Here I am, Lord. Like little Samuel. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. But God is willing. That will make us strong. The men of, uh, I read a quote. I don't know where it was. Acts of serve, uh, Christian service or somewhere. Where she said, men of action and decisiveness. Those are the men God is looking for. Not timid. Not scared. Not worried. What are they going to think about me? You know, God says, hey, go on that street corner and go preach for a little bit. Oh, but Lord, I, you know, just do it. God's already working. If he told you to do something, he's working for you. He's already prepared. God is the greatest way. We're just instruments. You know, it's not when I'm cooking, the instrument isn't doing it. I'm doing it. It's just helping me. Or God's helping. Number six. Catherine. What qualifications are needed to be a witness for God? Romans 12, verse 1 through 3. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So that's our service. That's our qualification. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. There's a lot of stuff in that verse, in those verses. Wow. You want me to read the uh, Yeah, any comments on that? Living sacrifice. What, what does that say to you? In what ways can we... Be a living sacrifice. Or what can we sacrifice to be witnesses for others? Our time, our money, our resources, sacrifice our pride, our judgments, self pleasure, right? But as Sister said, there's a lot in there. Uh, we, yeah, go ahead, read the. Quote. You know what that makes me think of, though? Uh huh. Um, how do we do that? How do we how do we be a living sacrifice acceptable unto God? And 
I think verse 2 tells us, it says, transform by the renewing of your mind. Like, when we, when we renew our minds daily and hourly, like that, we can be a living sacrifice. It's, it's about a rewrite. It's like re, we're rewriting our mind. And God wants us to, like, God is going to help us to rewrite our minds. And it's, it's like, like, it's a daily experience. Just like the Bible says, I die daily. Um, and it's a daily choice for us to renew our minds and to be a living sacrifice. And that living sacrifice is denying ourself. Yeah, and like what we shared, the, um, the sin, selfishness, and Satan. <laughs> Because it says, be not conformed to this world. Because the world tells us, don't sacrifice yourself. Preserve self. Lift up self. Put self first. That's big right now in the world, right? Self. How can I get ahead? How can I? So we got all these programs, self-betterment programs. Be a better you. And the thing is, God wants us to become a better version of ourselves. But it's about, like, how we do it. I think God wants us to be Christ. Yeah, I yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's really, at the end of the day, when we really surrender and allow the Holy Spirit to take over, Paul, Paul put it perfectly. It's no longer I that live. I'm, I'm alive. My flesh is here. Mm -hmm. But Christ liveth in me. Yeah. Truly him. And it's by the renewing of the mind daily. Mm. So it all starts there. Mm. Yeah. So God has to captivate your mind before you're even willing to do all this. Mm -hmm. You want to read that quote? Sure. God's cause at this time is in special need of men and women who possess Christ-like qualifications for service, executive ability, and a large capacity for work, who have kind, warm, sympathetic hearts, sound, common sense, and unbiased judgment, who will carefully weigh matters before they approve or condemn, and who can fearlessly say no or yea and amen, who because they are sanctified by the Spirit of God, practice the words, All ye are brethren, striving constantly to uplift and restore fallen humanity. That's beautiful. That's a lot. Yeah. Qualifications. What, what, what are some of them? A large capacity to do what? Work. Work. So for lazy, disqualified. And if you are lazy, ask the Lord to get you out of that spirit of laziness. The Bible says if we ask anything according to his will, is it God's will that you're not lazy? Yes. Yeah. Is it God's will that you're not fearful? Yes. That you're not timid? Yes. That you're not judgmental? Uh -huh. She said, what? A large capacity uh, for work who have kind Warm, sympathetic hearts. I don't always have a sympathetic heart. If I don't have it, if we don't have it, how do we resolve that? By going to the one who has it. Lord, I'm not sympathetic. Sometimes I couldn't care less. Change that for me. But these are qualifications that she said. These are, these are things we need. Sympathetic hearts. Sound common sense. Not everybody has common sense. Common sense ain't so common no more. <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> you know? Uh, unbiased judgment. That's hard. Because a lot of us, I know I have it sometimes, preconceived ideas, judgments. Like who's going to accept Christ and who's not? Like a lot of times, outward appearance does not say. Yeah. Or no. oh, they're too hard or whatever. Who would have ever thought that Nebuchadnezzar would have accepted the Lord. Nobody. 
but because of Daniel's faithfulness. Because of his witness. Because instead of, imagine all the other Jews, they hated probably the king because he captured them. They're slaves now. But he loved his master. He loved the king. Even though he was under subjection against his will, still loved him. Sympathetic. She says, unbiased judgment who will carefully weigh matters before they approve or condemn. Do we do that? Do we condemn those before we even know the situation? That's really what judgment is. That's wrong judgment. Condemning someone before we know the situation. Before we know every variable to it. These are things that these you could write these things down, make a list, and wherever you're lacking, pray that the Lord help you in this area. Because I'm going to go back and write these down and do that. Lord, man. She says, who can fearlessly say no or yea because they are sanctified by the Spirit of God. Any thoughts? Any more thoughts on that? The, who can fearlessly say no or yea and amen. Hmm. That's, that's really interesting. Why is that? God wants, like, just like we, what we shared before, is God wants us to be decisive. Hmm. Like, know where we stand. Hmm. That really speaks to me because sometimes I've, struggle with indecision mm. or or when someone asks me a direct question i do everything to oh avoid <laughs> saying a direct answer <laughs> so i've been really praying praying about uh praying to god about having a more direct way of communicating yeah, yeah. with man these things are impossible with god all things are possible amen Sometimes it's hard to see past ourselves, especially our inabilities, our deficiencies, our struggles. But God can make us mighty witnesses. Number seven, I'll go ahead and do that one. <laughs> the little caption here says, a love of the truth. Number seven says, what knowledge is essential for freedom from sin? John Chapter 8, verse 32. What knowledge is essential for freedom from sin? John 8, 32. It says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I'll read the note, unless somebody has a comment on that. Uh, in these final hours of probation for the sons of men, when the fate of every soul is so soon to be decided forever, the Lord of heaven and earth expects his church to arouse to action as never before. <clears throat> Those who have been made free in Christ through a knowledge of precious truth are regarded by the Lord Jesus as his chosen ones. Favored above all other people on the face of the earth. And he is counting on them to show forth the praises of him who have called them out of darkness into marvelous light. The blessings which are so liberally bestowed are to be communicated to others. The good news of salvation is to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Any thoughts? Yes. Do you have a mic? Okay. I often want... Oh, happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy, happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Um, I often wondered on on that that um, story about the the guy who's... Par uh, he's he's blind. And um, the Pharisees is like, whose fault is that? Is that the parent's fault or is that the child's fault? And, they, and um, he said it was the, for the glory of God. And um, whenever we, whenever we share our testimony, whenever we share how God has um, delivered us from sin or from sickness or from whatever, anything, um, we show the glory of God. 
And um, we want to glorify God because, because it was really, truly God. He called us. There, we couldn't call ourselves. How many of us were out there like, okay, you're religious, please get away from me, you know? And, and it was because of the call of God that, that we got interested in it. Sherry, Sherry was sharing a story last night about a man who's like, yeah, I don't think you'll ever win my heart over. And it happened. And it's because it's, it's the glory of God. It's God who wooed him. It's God who connected him to the people. It was God totally. It was God. And, and sometimes we want to take credit for that. And really, for the, the way that we could glorify God is by sharing our story with other people. You know, it's interesting because you said about the blind man, right? So if you're blind, what do you see? Nothing. Darkness. When Christ opened his light, what happened? Light. Everything. And what did he go forth and do? Give praise. Just like she, what she just wrote. He is counting on them to show forth the praises of him who have called them out of what? Okay. Into marvelous light. God has called each and every one of us out of darkness. And that's our job. Is to call people out of darkness. That don't realize they're in darkness. And you know? Yeah. He's still continually, continually bringing us out of more darkness. Mm. Like, it's not just a one-time act. No. Because it's, like I, like I shared earlier, it's a renewing of the mind. So there's constantly things that God is revealing to us, and God has shown us, like, let, let those things go, and bringing us into more and more light. Imagine this. You're in a tunnel, right? It's pitch black. And the tunnel is long. Now you're here, tunnel, the end of the tunnel is here, the entrance, the door. But when you open that door, what happens? But you're still in darkness. But the light is there to guide you, what? Out of the darkness. But you're still in darkness. God is trying to bring us out because there's darkness still in our lives. There's things. But he, he opened the door. And that's our job as witnesses. It's not to pressure anybody. It's not to beat up on anyone. It's to open the door so they can see the light. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. It's hard in a world where everything is a lie now. No one can tell the difference. It's hard. That's why we truly need God's spirit. Because only the Holy Spirit and convict someone of the truth. Yes, Sister Deborah. Oh, I was just going to say that. Um, we're, we are trying to bring people out of the light, but it's through... Out it's of darkness. Or out of the darkness, excuse me. Uh, but it's through the light that God has shined on us that reflects Him because of, you know, we change our behavior and stuff. And um, sometimes I think that, that we... I, I think what stops us from going forward to help somebody is we think that we have to bring them out of the darkness, that we that it's our duty to um, convict them and to make sure that it happens. But really, it's God's God God's the one who does that. And if we think we have to do that, we're incapable of doing that. We're not going to want to go out and talk to the people. And um, I shared with you guys before the guy who. Um, when we were, we were in like, it wasn't court, but you know, like they have like a meeting and you go in and you get to say, um, we were, we're, we were going against the marijuana thing and, and that guy came in to speak and then at the end he's like, why did, why did you allow people to be talking about God when, you know, this is a, this is a, um, a civil matter? And um, the guy was so angry about it and it really made us feel, feel bad when we were walking away. But... You never know if God hasn't reached that guy by now. You know, he, he could have, we would never know. We, we don't see the whole picture. But if we just do our part, which I feel like we did that day, if we just do our part, then God, you know, if everybody cooperated with God, I think that more and more people would turn to God that would seem hopeless, like they would never do that. But we might never see it. But thank God he, he does. You don't leave anybody behind who doesn't want to be. Second Corinthians, I just want to read 
want to give you guys scripture. Chapter 4, verse 4 to 6. Let me know when you're there. Four, four to six. It says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest what? The light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So, what is that light? That gospel. What is the gospel? That Christ died for our sins. He has forgiven. There are so many people in this world that are going around heavy burdens. Not realizing, not knowing that, that Christ, he's already forgiven them. He's already loved them. He's already died for them. All they have to do is come to him and believe. And they're waiting for us. It says for, Paul says, for we preach not who? Ourselves. Ourselves. But Christ Jesus, the Lord. And ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. Now, this is in regards to the darkness and the light, what we were talking about. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of what? Have shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So what truly is that light? If, 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 if the light is in Christ, how many of us believe that Christ is God? Okay. 1 John 4, verse 8, what does it say? God is love. So what is the light that the world needs? Uh, if you don't know what love is, meditate upon it in the Word. 1 Corinthians 13, the cross, so many areas where we see what love is. The sacrifice, God so loved that He gave not out of abundance, but his only. His only. That's hard. Um, um, number eight. Who would like to do that? Or Sherry, did you have a comment? Did you have a comment? Okay. Okay, go ahead. Number eight, what is even more essential than knowledge of the truth? Second Thessalonians two. Second Thessalonians two. Oh, that's Timothy. Hold on. Two ten. Ten and eleven. It says and with all deceivableness and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they shall believe a lie. So there we go, right back to the love. Mm. That's it. That's right. What is even more essential than knowledge of the truth? You know, it's receiving it. You know what I've learned at being a Christian for now seven years is why a lot of people aren't receptive to the truth. It's not because it's not true. It's because there's no love in it. If the love is there, and that love can only go by, come by the Holy Spirit. Because it's the Holy Spirit that puts us, that gives us the heart to love. Amen. Jesus said, I'm looking for them to worship me that worship me in spirit and in truth. You care. Amen. That's the greatest witness. When you're driving down the street, you know, I presented this this morning to some people about what would you do in this situation because we can become legalistic, especially on the Sabbath. <laughs> you drive down, it's the Sabbath. You drive down the road, and the Holy Spirit tells you, hey, you're on your way to church. The Holy Spirit tells you, hey, pull over. I want you to go talk to that person. You don't know why, but you either got two ways. You can be like, no, I'm on my way to church, kind of like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Good Samaritan, right? Or just listen. You go and you listen, and as you're listening, to, and you talk to the man, the man just opens his heart up to you. Little do you know that this man is very hungry. And the Lord puts it on your heart, take this man and go eat. 
But Lord, it's the Sabbath. I can't spend money. I can't do this, but the Lord knows exactly what this man needs. Take the man to eat. And as you're eating, he opens his whole heart. You talk to him for hours. You spend time with him. And you preach the gospel to the man and you receive Christ that day. Because you stepped outside of yourself and you love that man. It's hard. It's hard. But God is looking for people who are willing to love the unlovable. Have you ever hugged a stinky homeless person? Not attractive. But I've gotten some of the most joy going on Skid Road. Anybody know what Skid Road is? You've been there with us. Remember Skid Road? Horrible, isn't it? It's a, it's a homeless town in L.A. Nothing but killers and murderers, prostitutes, and drug addicts. The place smells horrible. But when we went out there and shared the Lord, it was the greatest. So we need a love of the truth. I have a comment about the love of the truth. Yes. Yesterday in my um, uh, family worship online, we were talking about people who they they just they just like having knowledge more than they actually love the truth. Because if you believe the truth and you love the truth, you will do the truth. And we're not seeing that in people who are. Um, a lot of times we like just a general. We call ourselves Christians, but we're not seeing the the character of Christ reflected in those people is because they like just having the knowledge more than actually the knowledge giver. And so they don't they don't act out the truth that, that um, they get because they don't have a love for it. I mean, I know people who have been at Venice their whole lives and they can quote every spirit of prophecy book and all the Bible, and, but they're mean. Like, how is that? It's all about our prerogative. Why do we come to Christ? just to learn information. My mom was like that. She was a mean Christian. And that's why she was such a bad witness. I love my mom. The last few years of her life, she became a great witness. And finally, God broke through. But growing up, she was a bad... That's why I hated Christianity. Because of my mom. Such a bad witness. But she became a good witness when she surrendered her heart. That's the head knowledge. We have a lot of those. You go to camp meetings, some day I've been to camp meetings, a lot of people with head knowledge. They know prophecy inside out, the Eastern questions, 1260, all these prophecies. Daniel 11, they'll bring that up. But yet they're so mean, so judgmental. God knows our hearts, and he knows those who desire to know him, and he will put in them a heart to know them. If they truly want to know, he will reach them. That's why it says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. But that truth is not just, not just like facts. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus also says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let me ask you a question. Can you tell the difference? Can you tell when someone actually loves you? Yeah. So that Usually. truth of that true love, wow, he really loves me. That's what sets you free. When someone sees you in their life consistently, consistent, and that's a big thing that we have to focus on. Lord, help me be consistent. But consistency, you're there for someone who no one else is there for, and they just they're convinced by your love that what you believe in the word is true. And because they see that consistency, they start to believe it. You know, I was just thinking about, like, what is love? Like, what's the definition of love? We can say, like, God is love. But love is truly manifested um, the most when you love a person but you don't see that they respond like like when they don't respond back to your love like all the time or like people make mistakes we make mistakes when you when you look at god you know what's really going to vindicate god's character 
of what love is. Like, God is love, right? But what really showed us actually that God is love is that he sent his son. And when he got, when, when Jesus was on this earth, he was like the, the ultimate example of love. And what happened, like, to the people? They rejected him. They rejected him. But that never stopped his love towards, towards the other people. And that is what won them to Christ. So when we, when we have God in our hearts, and it's like that a lot of times. I see, I see so many broken marriages. And why is that? We all have different ways that we want to be loved and different expectations of why we want to be loved. But love, love is when you love that person despite, like, and you sacrifice for them. Despite the way that you think that it's not about how you think you, they should be loved, but it's about how they understand. And you, you love them despite the fact that maybe they have faults, they have failures, they have... They have these things, but that's what love is, especially in a living in a fallen world. Like that's that really love, what love is. That love is seen. We see it in the book of Jeremiah, where God compares His people to the woman and Himself as the, the husband, right? And the woman constantly rejects them. And he still loves them. Hosea. Hosea is a prime example of God's love towards us. And it's hard. That love is super, it's supernatural. It did. And yet he still loved us. My testimony is from a couple comments before. Okay. Um, I cried and tried to be good. I knew I should be good. God didn't take any dirty hearts to heaven. <laughs> and I knew my heart was not good. I was discouraged, real bad, downcast. In grade school, I felt real bad. And then halfway through sixth grade, I went to camp meeting. And I found out that God had a way to save me, even me. <laughs> I, I, I knew I was not savable, but he could. And I was so happy. I went to my parents and I said, why didn't you tell me? They said, we did. <laughs> um. I began making my bed, had first friends combing my hair. Life was a wonderful thing. I had hope. I had joy. I had peace that I didn't have before. Amen. It was wonderful. I wanted to tell the whole world. <laughs> you were ready to witness, huh? Mm-hmm. Once you received that love. And that was the answer to the question, what is even more essential than knowledge? The love of the truth. The love of it. Do we love it? Or is it grudging? Is it hard to perform? Is it hard to do? It gave me hope. Yes. I had lost hope. Many try to do the things that God requires without the heart. And they think that they're saved. But that's not it. I God was willing to do anything, but I didn't know what. Yeah. And okay. really, God did it. I can do it. <laughs> if, you, if you lack that love, go to the one that is love. Ask him to put that love in your heart. You will. He's working on me. Day by day, I ask him. Even when it seems hopeless. Lord, I know you can do it. Help me. I may not always see it. You know, we don't always see it, especially when it comes from the first point of view. But others, they start to see it little by little. But God can do it. We need a we need that love. You wanna read that quote? Uh 
Yeah, um, but I wanted to say something too. Um, okay, we're almost done, so. Okay, I'll read it. Um, the five foolish virgins had lamps. This means a knowledge of scripture truth, but they had not the grace of Christ. Day by day, they went through a round of ceremonies and ex external duties, but their service was lifeless, devoid of the righteousness of Christ. The Son of Righteousness did not shine in their hearts and minds, and they had not the love of the truth, which conforms to the life and the character, the image and the superscription of Christ. The oil of grace was not mingled with their endeavors. Their religion was a dry husk without the true kernel. They held fast to forms of doctrines, but they were deceived in their Christian life full of self-righteousness and failing to learn lessons in the school of Christ, which if practiced would have made them wise into salvation. Can I say something now? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I think that um, God says to break up that fallow ground, uh -huh. and that's not a part that he does. That's a part that we need to do. And if we cooperate with him, then we're not going to be like that. And... Um, I know it's easy for us to look at people who's like that, and, and they might be struggling trying to figure that out, but until they realize that, can they do anything about it? Just like, a, just like a sinner out there, until they learn the love of God, can they do anything about, about the situation they're in? And so sometimes in, in, um, the, in our church, uh, we don't share so something like that with them. Maybe we don't know to share it or maybe they, we expect that they know or whatever. And then another thing is sometimes the way we behave causes a person to stumble and to fall because um, I, I was reading the other day about people who, who come in and they want, they're, they're excited for the Lord and then there's the, the ones who've been around for a long time. They're like, Calm down, you know. It's, they put their fire out. Yeah, they put their fire out. And, and so these people, they're really excited. And they go out to share the truth without having the truth. But they think that they have the truth. And they're trying to share it. And so when they're, and, and they get in front, and or they become pastors or whatever. And they're trying to bring something new into the, um, into, you know, the religion. And, and that's against what God says. But they were ruined not not as when they became a, a a pastor, but before they became a pastor at the very beginning. And she was talking about that. I was like, wow, that's powerful. So what we're doing for those people who's coming in. For the sake of time, I'm just going to zoom past these next few questions. It says, how should the things a Christian believes affect his life? Titus 2.10. Question is, how should the things a Christian believes uh, affect his life? Titus 2.10, last part. It says, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. The Lord knows the thoughts and purposes of man and how easily he can melt us. How his spirit like a fire can subdue the flinty heart. How he can fill the soul with love and tenderness. How he can give us the graces of his Holy Spirit and fit us to go in and out in laboring for souls. The power of, the overcoming, uh, of his overcoming grace should be felt throughout the church today. And it may be felt if we take heed to the counsels of Christ to his followers. As we learn to adorn the doctrine of, of, the doctrine of Christ our Savior, we shall surely see of the salvation of God. Those who make any pretensions to godliness should adorn the doctrine they profess and not give occasion for the truth to be reviled through the inconsiderate course of action. Owe no man anything, says the apostle. You ought now, my brother, to take hold earnestly to correct your habits of indolence, redeeming the time. Let the world see that the truth has wrought a reformation in your life. Number 10, as their enemies observed Peter and John, what did they realize about them? Acts 4.13, that they had been with Christ. We read it earlier, but uh, Acts 
Now this is the enemy, so to speak, right? It says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. It says, no longer were their hopes set on worldly greatness. They were of one accord, of one heart, one soul. Christ filled their thoughts. The advancement of his kingdom was their aim. In mind and character, they had become like their master. And men took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. So their minds became filled with the thoughts of Christ, right? Christ filled their thoughts. And the advancement of his kingdom, that was their only aim. Number 11, what counsel was Jeremiah given when God chose him to witness for him? Jeremiah 1, 8, 9. Who would like to read that real quick? Be not afraid of their faces. Oh, wait, oh sorry. Eight, uh, Jeremiah 1. Go. I mean... Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth, in thy mouth. Amen. Uh, says the same God who gave his messages to Moses Jeremiah will give his word to his witnesses in this generation. For it is not ye that speak, Christ declares, but the spirit of your father speaketh in you he bids us go forth to speak the words he gives us he gives us filling his holy touch upon our lips christ has given to the church a sacred charge every member should be a channel through which god can communicate to the world the treasures of his grace the unsearchable riches of christ there is nothing that the savior desires so much as agents who will represent to the world his spirit and his character there is nothing that the world needs so much as the manifestation through humanity of the Savior's love. All heaven is waiting for men and women through whom God can reveal the power of Christianity. Last question, what reaction to our witness may we also expect? Ezekiel 33. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not, what? Do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And, and, <coughs> and lo, thou art unto them a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice, and can play well on an instrument, for they hear thy words, but do them not. So, that goes back to that formalism, right? We need the love of the truth. We need a love for it. And if we don't have that love, we need to ask for that love. So that we can't, because we can't be witnesses until we have the love of Christ in our hearts. We cannot force God on anyone else. As much as we want up the habit, we can't make them. No. But the love itself is a witness for God, is a witness for the truth. So, if we lack that love, I want to encourage you, as I am, to plead with God for that love in your heart. You, you said that um, if you don't have love in your heart, you can't be a witness. But Jonah didn't have love in his heart for the Ninevites, and they all were saved. The whole um, city was saved. And he didn't have a love for them. And I think that if, you know... But we're not in the time of that. Huh? The love is what wins souls to Christ. Love does win souls yes. to Christ, but regardless if you love a person or not, you should still witness to them. How can you witness without that love in your heart? How did Jonah do it? That was different. How is that different? He did not want to go to Nineveh because he knew exactly. how evil he they were. And because he didn't have that love in his heart. That love wasn't there. He was just doing it because it was what was commanded of him to right. do. Right. And, and that's we're commanded difference. to go through, uh, through that's the, the whole. That's the difference we're talking about here. You could know to do something that's right and not have a love for it. That's not the same as having the love for it and doing it that's the difference 
He, it's like pulling someone by the ear to do something. God no. can God use a no. wicked person to teach someone else. He that, can use wicked people. Yes. yes. I mean, you could, you could witness without the yeah. love in your heart, but you'll be a very weak witness. Your, we, your witness I, won't be true. I think that it's God who moves in the hearts of the people. If we open our mouths, whether we like the person or we don't like the person, um, they got a chance of being saved. But if we don't go to a person... They, don't, they probably don't have a chance unless somebody else does. Because if Jonah didn't go to Nineveh, they would have perished. I hear you. We'll agree to disagree. Okay. All right. Yes. Exactly. Why is it that they didn't know? Mm. Mm. Amen. So, do we want to be witnesses? Do we want that love in our hearts? Well, let's pray. Thank you. 